so far, I feel really good about this. Like, I'm feeling very good about this. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel and welcome back to my kitchen. My name is Amanda and this week we are tackling croissants. Now I do croissants almost daily as part of my day job, but I do that in a commercial setting in a commercial kitchen with proof boxes and standard ovens and large batch sizes. So that is completely different from what we're gonna be doing here today. I just wanted to prove that even though croissants are a little intimidating, kind of like maybe a little difficult and very time consuming, it is something that you can do at your house in your oven. We will be using a cookbook recipe today. This is Tartine's cookbook. They make amazing product. They have amazing pastries and amazing recipes. I definitely recommend this cookbook, but they have a great recipe for croissants in here um, that are formulated for your home oven. So this is what we're gonna be using today for the recipe. All that being said, this recipe is gonna be split into three parts over three different days. So today we are gonna be talking about the dough. Tomorrow we are going to be doing the laminating process. And the day after that, we are gonna be actually doing the shaping and the baking. You really can um, do this in like two days, but I really wanted to make sure that I took my time and explained everything well and gave everything the proper rest that it needed. So, Yes, <laughs> this will be taking three days for me to do. Croissants are a yeasted laminated puff pastry. So basically what you do is you have your croissant dough and you sheet it out, put a big ass butter block in the middle and envelop the butter in the dough. And then it gets sheeted and folded and sheeted and folded and that big ass block of butter gets thinned out and folded over so many times that you have hopefully multiple like dozens of layers of dough and butter and dough and butter and dough and butter. So what happens when you bake that is it creates all of those crispy, crunchy, insane layers in a croissant when you bite into it and that beautiful honeycomb spiral effect too that you don't find in just regular rolls. So I feel like there was a lot of talking and a lot of awkward pauses. So I'm not gonna waste any more time. We're just going to get into making the dough. So Tartine's croissant recipe actually varies from other recipes and I think in a good way. Tartine's recipe uses a pre-ferment or in this case we use a poolish. It's just a mixture of your liquid, flour, and yeast. And it kind of gives the yeast a head start. It gives it a chance to start the fermentation process a little earlier. Um, I started this last night, so technically I guess this is taking four days. But I had this, made this last night. It is just um, the milk, flour, and yeast, like I said, mixed together. You can just mix this together and cover it with a cloth and let it sit out at room temperature for about two hours, um, but I opted to just cover it in plastic wrap and leave it in my fridge to slow ferment overnight. We are still adding more yeast to the dough, but this just gives it a chance to kind of get started ahead of time a little bit. Using a pre-ferment is nice um, because it does cut down on regular bulk fermentation a little bit um, and does give you kind of a kickstart on the flavor of your croissants. So I have all of my ingredients scaled out here. Um, I'm going to have everything listed down in the description box below, including the ingredients for the poolish that I made last night. So I am just going to pop this poolish into my mixer here. It literally just looks like a dough. And to that, we're gonna add the rest of our yeast. I have active dry yeast right here. And we're just gonna mix that all together. All right, and now we are going to add half of our milk mixture and salt and flour while the mixer is running on a low speed. Sugar and salt going in right now. It might take a minute, but what you're looking for is for the poolish to start breaking up into the milk mixture and it's not just one solid mass swimming 
in a bowl of milk. <laughs> so now that it's mostly broken up, I'm gonna go ahead and add all the flour here. This is bread flour. It is important that you use bread flour. It has to do with protein content and stuff like that. Um, but I did use 100% bread flour here. And we're gonna mix this on a low speed for about 30 seconds or until the flour is almost completely incorporated. All right, I'm just gonna give this a good scrape. Make sure there's nothing stuck to the bottom or the sides. And now um, with the mixer, again, a low speed, I'm gonna add the rest of the milk and I have one tablespoon of melted butter here too and that's gonna go in and then our dough will be finished. So after adding the milk and the melted butter, I let it mix for um, about a minute or so, just until the dough fully came together into one cohesive mass and it started cleaning the sides of the bowl. So now we have something that looks like this. It is incredibly tough and really kind of hard to work with. We couldn't do anything with this right now. What we're gonna do is we're gonna let this sit in the bowl. You can leave it right here. We're gonna let it sit in the bowl covered with like a plastic wrap or a tea towel and it's gonna sit here for 30 minutes. So after those 30 minutes are up, we'll give it one more good mix and we'll get it ready for the overnight slow proof. All right, so I am going to set a timer for 30 minutes and I will be right back. All right, so it's been about 30, 40 minutes or so um, and the gluten has relaxed just a little bit. So now I'm gonna put the dough hook back in and we're gonna keep mixing it on a low speed for about five minutes until we get a nice smooth elastic ball. All right, so we've got a really nice smooth dough. I let it sit here for a little bit so that the gluten could relax again. So now what we're gonna do is we're going to wrap this in some plastic wrap and get it ready for an overnight slow fermentation. Just got some plastic wrap here. Yes, it's red. I've had it since like December. <laughs> I'm gonna flatten this out into a nice long rectangle. If you get this out into a rectangle, now, like a nice flat rectangle now, it'll be easier to get it into the shape that you need it when you start um, laminating. Um, Cause you kind of need it in like a rough rectangle shape anyway, but. All right, so now that we're in a nice rectangle-esque shape, this is going to go into the refrigerator and it's gonna sit there and chill and relax overnight. Not only are we gonna bring the temperature of the dough down so that it better matches the temperature of the butter block we're gonna have, we're relaxing the gluten so that it doesn't shred or tear or put too much strain on itself when we go to roll it out and laminate it. This is kind of the part where you can cut the time down a little bit. You can put this in the freezer for like an hour or two and then the refrigerator for an hour or two. Um, but for right now, I am just gonna put this in the fridge overnight. So that is day one done. I will see you guys bright and early tomorrow morning when we get the butter block ready and get the dough prepped for lamination. Hello guys and welcome to day three of croissants. I know what you're thinking, Amanda, what happened to day two? Um, technical difficulties. First and foremost, I'm gonna apologize for my lack of face. It's just too damn early right now. Actually, you know what? No, I'm not apologizing for my lack of face. Fuck you, I don't have to wear makeup. <laughs> anyway, so I had audio issues for day two of croissants, so the whole thing is filmed. There's just no audio, it's just me talking and no sound coming out. So basically, here's what you missed. 
This is arguably one of the worst days to have to do a voiceover for. You'll see that I'm talking because obviously I thought my mic was working. It was not, so I'm just going to do my best to try to remember what I was saying and hopefully explain it well. So we're going to start off with the butter block here. I sliced some regular unsalted butter into three equal slices long ways. You can use European style butter and in fact that will yield a better result. I just wanted to see if I could use regular American unsalted butter and it worked well. So if that's all you have, you will be fine. I grabbed a really long piece of parchment paper here. We're going to want to measure out our butter block to be a specific size. So I folded it in half and you'll see that I'm using a ruler to measure out our butter block to be 8 by 12 inches. So I'm measuring out 8 inches wide and 12 inches long. This way we'll be able to place our butter slices inside that folded area and be able to roll it out to be exactly the size that we want it to be. So we'll just fold the parchment paper in half, fold the corners to lock it in, and be able to create a nice even butter block. You can put your butter into the mixer to soften it and to um, just kind of squish it into the shape that you need, but bashing it out with a rolling pin is just pretty cathartic and it's actually pretty quick. If your parchment paper tears or rips, which it could do, it's fine. You can either make another parchment square or you can just fold it over and keep trucking along. Mine didn't rip, it just kind of busted open at the seams. So after bashing out the butter and it is nice and soft and pliable, you're going to want to roll it out into the corners and try to get it as even as possible without any valleys or any little bumps. Try and get it as smooth as you possibly can. Something else that's really important is you want to make sure that your prepared dough and your butter block are similar consistencies. If your butter is way colder than your dough, it will just break apart and you won't have an even layer throughout your dough. If your butter is a lot warmer than your dough, you run the risk of it just melting and you won't have those beautiful layers that you see. It will just melt and create one roll. So if you have to stick either one in the freezer or in the fridge, do that. I actually stuck my butter block in the freezer because it had warmed up considerably while I was rolling it out. But just kind of poke them, make sure that they are both chilly but pliable. Otherwise you'll have a hard time rolling it out. So while my butter block was chilling, I prepared our dough for the lock-in phase. The lock-in phase is when you roll out your dough to prepare it for the butter block in the first place. Here we're going to roll it out to about 12 inches wide and 18 inches long. No matter how big your butter block is, one good rule of thumb is that your dough should be just barely as wide as your butter block, if not a touch wider, and three times as long as your butter block. You can check by just grabbing your butter block and making sure that it is the right length and width. Here I'm making sure that my edges are squared. You want to make sure that you don't have that many imperfections. Everything is as squared off as possible because any bumps or any weird irregularities are just going to be multiplied every time you do a book fold. So here I just put the butter block on top of the dough, made sure that it was wide enough wherever it needed to be, but there wasn't too much slack. After locking the butter in, I crimped the edges to make sure that it was completely sealed up. There was no butter showing on any of the sides. And now we're getting ready to do the first of three book folds. You'll notice that I rotate it 90 degrees. You don't want to roll it long ways twice in a row. You don't want to stretch the gluten the same way twice in a row. So every time you roll your dough out to do a fold, you're going to want to rotate it 90 degrees. Each time you do a fold, you're going to roll your dough out to about 28 inches long by 12 inches wide. You'll see me take a ruler to make sure that I'm getting it at the right length each time and doing a proper tri-fold. After every tri-fold, I'm gonna wrap it back into the plastic wrap and it can either go into the refrigerator for about an hour or in the freezer for about 30 minutes. The idea is you want to relax the gluten that you just tensed up by rolling it out so much and keep the butter as cold as possible. So here I'm doing my second fold of three. 
So I'm going to roll it to the width that I need first. So again, we're going for that 28 by 12 inches. So I'm going to try to get the 12 inches wide first, and then I rotate it 90 degrees to get the 28 inches. Again, you don't wanna roll it long ways twice in a row. Rotate it 90 degrees every time. So I will roll it, measure it, roll it again. I got flour all over myself here. That's what, that's what this is. <laughs> so after rolling and measuring, I'm doing the second of three folds. Again, trying to keep the edges as squared as possible. If you have any ugly seams or imperfections, just roll that onto the inside. And then I'm gonna wrap it in plastic wrap and it's gonna go into the freezer for about 30 minutes. And then I'm doing the third tri-fold where again, I'm gonna get 12 inches wide and then rotate it to get 28 inches long. And then after getting to that length, I'm trying to brush away all the flour so that when it sits overnight, the flour doesn't absorb in and the layers stick together as well as possible. So after this last fold, it can stay in the freezer for about an hour and then you can go ahead and shape it. Or if you're doing what I did, put it in the freezer for one hour and then leave it in the refrigerator overnight. Thank you for bearing with me. I hope this made sense. Now back to Amanda for day three. Really the most important thing I think from that is make sure that you don't roll your dough the same way twice. So if you rolled it this way and then fold it, you're gonna wanna flip it and roll it the other way again, fold it, turn it another 90 degrees and then roll it and then fold it. So now here's what day three looks like. Day three is shaping. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna roll out our dough here um, and we're gonna get some beautiful shapes. Then it's gonna go and proof for two hours and then we're gonna bake it. And then we'll know at that point if we did it right. I've got my dough here. We're gonna roll it out to about 30 inches by 10 inches. That's what we're doing. My dog is really freaked out that I keep doing that. So we're at a little over 30 inches. I think this is gonna be perfect. The size is less important than the thickness. Um, for this amount of dough, that's like the size that was recommended. You can stretch it out while you're shaping it a little bit, but otherwise the dough will just be too thick. It won't proof right, it'll be too heavy. Do what you will with that information. Um, so we are at just about the size that I want to be at. So now you're gonna grab a pastry wheel or a pizza cutter. This is obviously a pizza cutter because it's fucking massive. Um, and we're gonna trim the edges. So we're gonna trim the top where you have all of your like seams and like layers and stuff like that and the bottom so you're gonna trim your two longest edges and obviously I didn't trim that much off just a little bit enough to expose the edges and see all of the layers so I have made myself two templates here for the two different shapes that we're gonna make. These are out of cardstock. Um, obviously, if you're gonna be doing this more often, use something that's not cardstock, like plastic or something, because then you can reuse it and wash it. But I just got these out of cardstock. This is a triangle that is 10 by three inches. So it's 10 inches this way and three inches this way. And this is a rectangle that's four by five. So it's four by five this way. This makes shaping easier because then obviously every single one that you do is the same exact shape, size and shape. So I'm gonna cut this in half. So half is gonna be regular rolled croissants and then the other half is gonna be, um, we're gonna do like a ham and Swiss kind of croissant. So it's gonna be folded in half like this. Okay, so I actually cut like one third for the meat and two thirds for the regular because I want more of the regular croissants. All right, so we are going to start with the regular plain croissants first. So I'm gonna get that template and we're gonna get our cutter back. We're just gonna cut some triangles. So 
So now that these are all cut, we're gonna go ahead and shape them. I've got a parchment lined sheet tray right here. They're gonna go directly from here to being shaped to the sheet tray and then uh, we're gonna set them out to proof and I'll talk about what that looks like in just a second. So to shape them, I've got a little bit of flour on the bottom here. We're gonna lightly tug on it just a little bit to elongate it and then we're gonna pull on the corners right here, stretch those out, fold those in and then just roll it like you would assume a croissant would be rolled. And then once you get to the end, you tug on the end right here, tuck it under and place it on your sheet tray. I don't know why, but this smell reminds me of pretzels for some reason. It's probably just the yeast, but like, that's all I can think of. Yeast should remind me of bread as a whole, not just pretzels, I don't know why. So as far as proofing goes, I'm assuming that none of you guys have a proof box in your house. I don't have one in my house, so if you have one in yours, I'm jealous. Please let me come cook in your kitchen. You want something that is warm and humid, but not too hot um, to proof these. If anything, err on the colder side because if it's too hot, it'll just melt the butter and your croissants will be greasy and gross. So what I'm gonna do, my oven's off. I'm gonna put these in the oven and I'm gonna put a pot of um, like boiling water underneath so it's hot and there's like steam and stuff in there. You wanna make sure that these have enough humidity in there, otherwise it'll develop a skin on the top. So if you don't wanna put um, the hot water in there, at the very least just spray them down with like water and like just like a spray thing so I'm gonna go do that and then we'll talk about the next shape so I already went ahead and cut out my dough rounds for the next shape uh, I didn't really think that you guys needed to watch me stand here and cut out a bunch of rectangles I felt like that was pretty self-explanatory but like I said I just used my little template to cut out all my rectangles so now we're gonna move on to the next shape this is gonna be a meat croissant normally you would use ham I don't have any ham in my house so this is this is speck which is ham, it's the same thing, but it's smoked ham. Right here, I've got some mustard, this is Dijon mustard, and I've got some Swiss. So this one's gonna be comparatively pretty easy. All we're gonna do is put about a tablespoon, we're gonna put about half a tablespoon of mustard, spread it down, not quite to the edges, because we don't want it to leak out if we can prevent it, so it'll go almost all the way to the edges. And then we're gonna put one slice of Swiss cheese down, and I took my smoked ham and I split it in half, so we're gonna put that down and then this just gets folded in half and then we're gonna set this on our lined sheet tray so I'm just gonna keep doing that and get all of these filled and shaped And I'm gonna make a few of them without any ham because my sister and I don't eat meat. So these are also gonna go into the humid oven with the croissants. The whole batch is gonna proof for at least two hours. Every 45 minutes or about halfway through, I would check to make sure it's still humid in there. Um, change out the water if you need to, the steaming water that we put in there, or give them another really good spray with some hot water. Just make sure that they're still humid and that they're still um, kind of moist or like, like a little wet to the touch. So I'll see you then. Hello, welcome back. All of these were proofing for around two and a half hours in my off oven. I replaced the water twice to get fresh steaming water in there. So we're gonna talk about the signs to know when your croissants are done proofing because it's more about those signs than it is about like the timing. Like originally I was gonna pull them at two hours but they weren't done so I left them in there for another half an hour and then I left them sitting um, at room temperature here for a little bit while the oven preheated because obviously they can't be in there while the oven is preheating. So what you're looking for is for them to at least have gotten bigger 
Um, doubling in size is ideal, obviously, um, but if they're at least bigger and they're puffier, that's great. Another sign is that when you lightly poke them, you don't want to jab them, but when you lightly poke them, the indentation that stays behind should slowly rise back up. It shouldn't just come back automatically and it shouldn't stay there. If it stays there, then it is not done yet. And then you want to make sure that they are slightly jiggly. So when you <laughs> shake your pan, they just kind of jiggle like jello, but you want to make sure that they're not slouching. They should still be firm and they should still have held their shape. While the oven is almost preheated, I went ahead and made an egg wash. So this is two eggs, um, two tablespoons of heavy cream and a pinch of salt. Everybody's egg wash is different. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and egg wash these lightly. You wanna go kind of light with this. You don't wanna be too heavy handed with this. You want it to be enough so that the croissants brown in the oven, but not so much that they're just covered in egg. Um, Cause that would be kind of gross to be biting into a croissant and all you get is egg. So I'm in a regular oven right now at 425. As soon as these go in, I'm gonna drop the temperature to 400, cook them for 10 minutes, rotate the pans, and then another 10 minutes. And I will do the exact same for the meat croissants here as well. And you wanna make sure you keep an eye on them. They should be a nice golden brown color, um, but they shouldn't be too, too dark. So yeah, I will see you guys once they've baked and cooled. Welcome back. So I think it's safe to say that the long three days of production have been worth it because look at all of the goodies that we have from just that one croissanto recipe. I got a dozen plain croissants, one of which I already ate. I got eight of these ham and Swiss croissants and I even got six little things of monkey bread because you really shouldn't ever throw scrap anything away. If you can use it, you should. So all of that leftover scrap that I had, I cut it up, rolled it into some cinnamon sugar, put it in the little muffin tins that I've got here and let them proof. I just let them sit out at room temperature while the rest of the croissants were proofing in the oven and while they were baking. So they're out for probably like four or five hours. And then I poured some maple syrup and brown sugar on top and then I just baked them like normal. I baked them the same way that I baked everything else. I will say that after dropping the temperature to 400 degrees, I ended up just doing 15, rotate and 15 because the first batch of croissants kind of took a little while longer than I anticipated. I think the best way for us to really get an insight on how we did is to cut one open. Oh my gosh, it just shatters. It look, oh, that's amazing. Oh my God. We got such a cute little honeycomb spiral effect. I will zoom in and show you a close up here in a second. They turned out amazing. I am so happy with how these turned out. I'm not gonna lie, shaping was an issue for some of them. This one straight up looks like an ice cream cone, but it tastes amazing. If you make these and show them to anybody, I guarantee you they're not gonna be like, mm, this one looks a little weird. They're gonna shut up and eat it and be amazed because you made croissants at home. I hope that all of the information that I shared was helpful and made somewhat sense. I know that day two got kind of weird with my cutout of audio. We did this. We did this without a sheeter. We did this without a fan in the oven. We did this without a proof box. We did this at home. So if I can do this, I guarantee you, you can as well. The meat ones, some of them fell open a little bit. So I think I would make sure to like press them down a little firmer than I did before. But most of them turned out very well. They look like little books. I will not be eating these, but I will definitely have my parents try them. 
I usually don't like to let you guys hear me eat because it's disgusting and the mic is right here. But did you hear that crunch? Did you hear that crunch? If you have any questions on anything, please let me know. If you try these, please let me know. Like I said, I got this recipe from the Tartine cookbook. This cookbook is amazing. It has so many recipes and variations of these croissants if you wanna do something similar. And yeah, if you like this video, please make sure to like and comment and let me know what you thought. Let me know if you try these. Um, tag me, I'll have my Instagram and my Twitter and everything down below. And I'll also have my blog down below where you can find all of my other recipes. So in the end, croissants take a very long time. From start to finish, this took me about two and a half, three days. But a lot of it is in active time. A lot of it is just sitting and waiting for the butter to chill, for the gluten to relax, for the dough to firm up. Um, it's really not that hard. It just takes a lot of patience and a lot of arm strength if you're rolling this out by hand. So yeah, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day and that's it. Bye! Oh my gosh.